44 years has much in common with the activities and actions of primitive man as I imagine him. It is my strong belief that the human race has known and abandoned magical sounds, visual beauty, and experience ritual more meaningful than those now current. Harry said, this is what I stand for, stepping as many millennia back as I possibly can to ancient Greece, ancient China, or in the ancient native traditions of America. <laughs> Born in 1901 in California and raised in a desert town, Parchard realized from an early age that he was gay. Not the best way forward in early 20th century America. His own feelings of existing outside of the acceptable norms of society led him to identify with others viewed in the same way, like the Yaqui Indians who lived in a small enclave in the desert close to his childhood home. His home life was constraining, and as an escape, he looked at archaic cultures which he saw as having more freedom. All his life, Parch used ancient beliefs as a basis for both his music and the way he lived. In 1934, with the assistance of his patrons, he spent a year in London studying ancient concepts of tonality and commissioning his first adapted reed organ, the Chromelodeon. But he wasn't content with just building these strange instruments. He had to continue to push musical boundaries. One interesting thing that the parts did, you know, very carefully, each one of these notes has an exact numerical relationship with everything else. But <laughs> after he built, uh, this by the way is of course a, a modern synthesizer that I have tuned to the 43 note per octave scale. He did it by taking a reed organ and taking each little reed out and retuning it himself by hand. As soon as he did that, he realized he had all these wonderful uh, individual notes but then he started doing the most amazing things with it. He would do something, I mean, he would smear it and go. Two, three, four. I'd like to do it again. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. His career was going from strength to strength and he returned from his European trip in 1935 with high expectations for the future. Unfortunately, the Great Depression badly affected his chance of future sponsorship. The Depression proved to be a boom time for the Hollywood musical. People craved escapism from the turmoil of their daily lives. And the strange musical outpourings of avant-garde composers were out of tune with public tastes. Parch made a decision to become a hobo Many artists since have paid lip service to life on the road, but few have ever taken it as far as Parch. For the next 10 years or so, he joined the great mass of unemployed people railroading and hitchhiking across the Midwest. Long ago, I said to myself, I think more than anyone else, life is too precious to spend it with important people. There are so many plays for status and uh, selling and one gets among a group of hobos and among transient orchard workers and right away there's a human contact, which doesn't mean that they always like each other, but there's a human contact without this fighting for place constantly. Uh, it's just a little sidelight on why I felt it necessary during the Depression to be a hobo and take a pack on my back. As a bum, Parch may have been homeless, broke, filthy and starving, but for the first time he felt truly free. He could openly express his sexuality and as a heavy drinker, indulge without the disapproval of the moral majority. This was his chance to completely escape modern society.
For over a decade, Parch composed no music, but he stored up experiences of every sort for later use. During the Depression, when one was put upon his own resources, so constantly, nobody was writing war and peace, and nobody was doing an unfinished symphony. But in little ways, there was a tremendous amount of creativity. Now, when I say creative, I, I'm, I don't mean poetry or literature or music or any of the things that we think of as the fine arts. I'm just talking about everyday living, like primitive man. <laughs> into a situation where everyone is a stranger. You have to make a decision very fast. And uh, you can say, hey, Mac, uh, will you watch my pack while I go into town? And just suddenly like this. And I've never been let down, never. Of course, hobos are extraordinarily uh, individualistic people. That's why they're hobos. They cannot conform to the society that the strictures of a city you never find them in cities to speak of. I'm talking about the Depression, which is what I know best. But I doubt if people have changed. In other words, what I'm saying is that, that uh, there are the same kinds of people of today. The there are the same kinds of people who will got to go out on the road and thumb their nose at society and say, I am going to, I'm going to do everything by myself. River, Y, O, Mer. He had no money, so when he would we cross the country back and forth. Whenever he needed money, he would get off and either wash dishes or pick cotton. He didn't believe in work as an ethic himself. The only work he'd ever done was early in his life he'd been a proofreader in Oakland at the newspaper. But other, otherwise he did these two manual jobs just to earn enough money to, to survive. It's a, it's a year he didn't talk much about, I mean it's a decade that he didn't talk much about, but it uh, left its mark on him for sure. It's pretty tough to be right in the drags on a night like this. I know I was a bum once myself. It was a, a traumatic existence for him. He almost froze to death on several occasions. Uh, he contracted syphilis and all kinds of related health problems. And I imagine that for some of that period, he must have despaired of ever being able to go back to his music. Yesterday I washed all my clothes in the Roseville jungle. The Depression was a time of sacrifice, but Parch never stopped being an artist. Amazingly, he continued to build instruments. He kept a journal called Bitter Music, in which he drew pictures of life on the road, kept a diary, and wrote down the inflections of individual hobos' speech patterns. These would fuel the compositions like U.S. Highball and Barstow that he later wrote about his decade on the road. I can stand that. And the dirt. Can stand everything but the shirts. He uh, became involved in music on the road. He heard music. He heard the patter of different voices, uh, act, different accents uh, from town to town. It was his organic, you know, an organic music lesson. My first contact with his music was, the real contact was the, this piece Barstow, which was um, hitchhiker inscriptions written down on a highway railing and then set to music. And the way he set them, they were like folk songs, like Woody Guthrie folk songs. She rose from 
her blanket with a gun in each hand said come all of you cowboys fight for your land going home to boston yaha massachusetts it's 4 p.m and i'm hungry and broke It's the, uh, it's the quality of the human voice. Uh, there's also the rather kind of uh, tangential and sort of ephemeral quality of the texts themselves, which are uh, collected in this rather haphazard way. And I think the accompaniment, I uh, particularly like the kind of harmonium sound um, and the way in which the intervals are gradually, gradually shifting. Yo -ho -ho, yo -ho -ho, yo -ha -ha, Go to 530 East Lemon Avenue in Monrovia for an easy handout. I like the sort of implied narrative in it. Also, the fact that it has this resonance with Parch's past about, you know, traveling across the country on flat cars, right, living the life of a hobo. It has that sort of rather romantic quality to it. I want my way. one half of desert to the east. Make that two more, three more. Do not think they'll let me finish my story. Hoping to get the hell out is my name. Johnny Rodwald, 915 South West Lake Avenue. Los Angeles, do -de -do. During rare moments of stability, Parch persisted in building instruments. His supporters also continued to champion his ideas, and in 1943, he was awarded a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation in New York. He could now leave the road for good with a set of bigger and ever more elaborate instruments. Luckily, I happened to be able to use one of them. This was the 1938 Cathara that he built himself in, in Los Angeles in, the, in an adult school uh, wood shop. I've built three Cathars since 1938, and these three are probably the first that have been built in the last 1,500 years. The Cathara is a lyre, the instrument used by the professional Greek musician. The lyre of Orpheus had three strings. The traditional number of strings was eight, but lyres were experimented with, of course. One of the very famous experimenters was Timotheus from Sparta, of all places, who increased the number of Cathars strings from eight to 12. For the crime of 12 strings, the Spartans drove the immoral Timotheus from their city. He had failed to realize that to dream of desirable changes is one thing, to act upon those dreams is another. My cathara has 72 strings, and I shudder to think what might have happened to me in ancient Greece. Basically, it's, uh, it's a bunch of guitars strung up right away because his whole concept of a chord uh, is a hexad, six notes. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, all just intonation, the root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, and eleventh harmonic for the musicians that understand that language. 
That was something new because usually on the piano or in harmony you only deal with one, three, and five. You double that number. And here they are. One of the pieces that he wrote early on was something called The Letter, which was a setting of a, a letter got from a hobo friend. The original version is for cathar and guitar. I usually play the guitar part, but at least you get an idea from it. Also an idea about his harmony, because here, for example, is a chord, another chord, a minor chord, and a major chord, but they're very close. And what he does is run them against one another. Cincinnati, Ohio, October 2nd, 1935. Hello, pal. Gee, I was glad to hear from you. Believe it or not, pal, I just received your letter today. It must have followed me all over the world. But it got to my wife, and she wrote it open and read it and sent it to me this morning. Well, I came back to East and run into a shotgun wedding, and I was a gold. Parch was always interested in the way his instruments looked. He was concerned as much with their visual beauty as with the sounds they made. It's a curious fact that the wine and liquor bottles will give approximately the same frequency under each brand name. For example, the lowest tone is an old heaven ale sour mash. The top is a uh, Bristol cream sherry. And uh, if you run out, if you don't get exactly this, the right tone here or the right tone here, you simply ask your friends to save your old heaven hill or whatever bottles. There was a dark humor in some of his instrument building such as the cloud chamber bowls, which took something destructive, Pyrex carboys used in atomic experiments, and put them to creative use. because of the seven brass artillery casings hanging here. And how much better to have them hang here than shredding young men's bodies on the battlefield. I think Harry Potter's instruments are absolutely important. He talked about himself as being what a philosopher, a carpenter seducing to philosophy or vice versa, I can't remember. But uh, his instruments are just very beautiful to look at and incredibly interesting to hear. You know, the man had a wonderful ear. He was a great craftsman. If for nothing else, he should be remembered for having, actually having made and invented these astonishingly beautiful instruments. Now, with the new instruments, the style of the music was beginning to change from vocal to instrumental works. The sheer size of the instruments compelled musicians to move in a different way, which led to a new form of performance part dance and part ritual theatre. He developed a quite elaborate idea which he called corporeality, which has to do with the attitude of the performing musician on stage, that the musicians have to use their whole bodies in performing, not merely their arms. I like to think of uh, what I'm doing as visual and corporeal and uh, I want the instruments on stage, and I want them to be beautiful. I also want the, uh, the uh, musicians to 